Uh, first of all, uh, I want to tell you that uh, I, I will try to uh, bring a kind of order with, with my presentation. Sometimes when uh, you have a kind of chaos in your mind, it's always useful to have an index. So I will talk first about uh, some principles uh, which, I uh, which I use to depart from my work. Then I will uh, show you the kind of uh, urban policies that the government is taking in terms of housing and how is uh, growing Mexico City and at the end of the well and then informal settlements where is the place where I used to work from the last eight years and um, finally I will show uh, some examples of my work as an architecture uh, from my point of view starting with the principles um, uh, architecture is not an issue of shapes, or not just an issue of shapes, but uh, it's, it's an issue of understanding. So uh, in uh, Mexico we have a very complex um, scenario, urban scenario, so if you want to really work with it, uh, you have to understand it first. So I will let you know a little bit about Mexico City. Uh, I also think that uh, spaces and cities are a, um, an expression of societies in relation to a specific and historic modes of production. And the only way we can see uh, what is happening with the cities is trying to understand the, the way we are producing and the way the modes we have to, to, to uh, making work the economical machine. Uh, also, I try to understand, or I like to understand spaces as a representation of who we are. Uh, further, an ideological representation, spaces show us the real values of societies and also show us um, uh, who we really are uh, beyond the, the ideological representation and beyond um, and, and beyond the, the uh, legal or the formal representation of each place. So, well, this is Mexico City. Mexico City is a place uh, with 20 million people, uh, 1,600 uh, 1, uh, square kilometers. We have a federal district that you can see it in the, in the gray area. And we have 42 municipalities for three different states of Mexico. Um, each municipality has a different law from each other, and also each state has different laws from each other and also from the federal district. So in a way, uh, what we can see here is a, a, an urban sprawl that um, is beyond control. Nobody is really controlling this dynamic urban dynamics, uh, from my point of view, is only responding to an economical and development uh, condition. Uh, if we see this particular map, we can see that the labor is concentrated in, in different areas. In these areas, gray areas, uh, you can find the industrial work, the, the industrial labor uh, in Mexico, and the uh, purple ones, that is a little bit hard to see, is the corporate, uh, corporate buildings, and also the global city, the, that kind of city that we love to call global city with these new and beautiful buildings, uh, really tall and really new, and with all this expression of the new development or the uh, strong development of the liberal economy. Uh, also, we have in the yellow areas, the new developments of housing, formal and informal, of Mexico. And if you see it, it looks like we are really crazy and schizophrenic because we are uh, building housing here and concentrating labor in these areas. This explains part of the everyday life of Mexico City in which a lot of people have to, to spend two or three hours in the car to get to their jobs and two or three hours to get back to their house. But in Mexico, uh, as in every other place in the world, I just see this suburbia exhibition you have outside, uh, we have this uh, scheme of, of housing and we have this propaganda and everybody in Mexico, every, every middle class guy in Mexico wants a house. A house with this scheme and a house that is oriented to families and in a, in a suburb with a 
commodities of, of the urban land, but also with the space of the uh, rural areas. And we have a lot of uh, influence uh, from uh, um, North America, not just the, the US. I think Canada also has this kind of, kind of developments uh, all around. This is incredible because this place is not in the US or Canada or Mexico. This is Inner Mongolia in the desert where the people used to have yuntas and be nomads. Uh, right now they are doing this kind of developments that have like this exactly same uh, idea of the suburb and the typology of the architecture in the suburb and the American way of life. Um, and well, of course in China they are looking to the future of West. Um, in Mexico we have our own version. Uh, first of all, every young guy in Mexico, uh, when they go out uh, from their houses, from their parent houses, uh, most of them buy a house. They don't rent. They want to have a house from the beginning. And the advertisement is always showing these beautiful families with beautiful kids uh, in, in the middle of gardens and flowers and palms and whatever. And they try to uh, make a difference be between dwellers and people who just live. No? Um, they want to uh, really create a segregation between the ones that uh, live in informal settlements, like these ones, and the ones that want to live, like in the US, no? Uh, with a, a kind of stores like 7-Eleven. Uh, and well, this is uh, a general kind of, of propaganda and advertisement. Then take, to, take us to this. This is the um, uh, kind of houses they are producing. Some of them have different styles, as you can see. Some of them are Spanish style, another are American styles or neocolonial styles or whatever style you want. And there are a lot of, uh, a lot of houses uh, as these ones. Them has uh, 60 square meters, and they are uh, just next to each other. Sometimes they share the same wall between one house and the other. And in a way, uh, they like to live in this place because they live in a kind of, um, uh, a kind of modernity, uh, a layer of modernity that the repetition and the colors can give us the idea of this, of this uh, modernity. Also, most of these areas are gated communities. They are close to the people. They don't uh, uh, have public space. They are inside a private per, uh, part of land, and they are very worried to to take out and uh, uh, and to have protection so nobody can get in unless you are invited. But this is the kind of places uh, that we are doing. This is Zumpango. This is a view where we can see how. Uh, this is a kind of a schizophrenic and neurotic organization of the land without not, nothing but houses. And this is an issue of credit. In, uh, from my point of view, uh, in Mexico, we are not producing houses. We are producing credits. These are like the rates in the US and in Mexico. And if we add uh, to the rates in Mexico uh, the different commissions for uh, insurance of death or insurance of uh, un unemployment or, and whatever other things, sometimes they end up paying around 22% uh, uh, to have a house. And the kind of house, if you make an exercise in one of these developers or in one bank uh, on how to get a house, you're going to see that an original house that probably is, it will be 57,000 US dollars, um, uh, you're going to end up paying almost 359% or 360% more than the original value of the house. But at the same time, the initial payment will be paid by the state. In Mexico, we have a lot of institutions that are trying to bring houses to the people. Uh, these institutions, housing in the institutions, become, uh, start to work in the 60s and 70s. And um, in that time, they used to create uh, new neighborhoods and, con and hire good architects and making good developments. 
Uh, but right now, they are just giving the initial payment to the bank or to the developer. So they are becoming in a kind of broker of credits. No? And, well, uh, in the last 10 years, we have produced almost 10, mi 10 million houses of this, on these conditions. Uh, probably this is not so, um, it sounds like a normal thing, but there is some images I want to show you. And I will let you know a little bit more about these spaces. This is the kind of development we are doing. There is a huge company named uh, Casas Geo. And Casas Geo used to do these uh, schemes of housing. Sorry. You're not going to see any house again. It's just, I, I, am, I was very uh, worried to just show uh, different houses. Uh, you can see the same, uh, some of the same uh, developments. Okay. In these places, they don't have public space. And public space, I understand it as a place where everything have the right, everybody have the right to be there, uh, no matter the difference between each other. Uh, in these places, uh, we really don't have public space we, because you don't have anything to do in the streets. You don't have stores, you don't have restaurants, you don't have any kind of uh, public services. Uh, you don't have trees, and you don't have anything to do in the streets, but going there to live in these particular places, which, by the way, are also gated communities. This gated community issue is a very uh, strange thing because they used to make gated communities to protect their neighbors from the uh, dangers of the huge city or from the or from outside the, the, the neighborhood. But uh, what the people didn't know at the beginning is that most of the rapers, most of the uh, killers and the criminals and drug dealing and whatever used to buy a house in these places. So probably you are going to live with these guys also next to your house. Um, they have a very bad quality uh, in architectural projects. Most of the cases, the houses are uh, 58 square meters. That's the average. The measures are 235 meters by 235 meters in the other. Uh, th th this is the minimal room. So every developer made these rooms as the bigger one. And uh, they are so, so little, so small, that any, f any furniture that you can buy in a normal store fits in the house. So there, there is another business, a complementary business, which uh, is in charge to doing a lit little furniture. So this little furniture can fit in your house. Nevertheless, you cannot fit in the furniture. <laughs> no? Um, so, and the, the, this, this company is, uh, name is Cabe. And Cabe, uh, in Spanish, is Cabe is fits in. No? So, well. Um, the distance, most of these places are at least two hours away from the center of the city. Uh, they have to move from these areas to um, the labor areas in Mexico City. Uh, they spend two hours or three hours in the car. The average is around two hours, a little bit more than two hours. Uh, going to work and two hours getting back from these places to their, to their houses. And also, um, with a very high cost. Um, it's estimated that 30% of the family income is oriented and is dedicated just to move to the head of the family. I mean, uh, just the father is going to, uh, to, to use 30% of the income to, to go to work and, and return. Another 30% will be for paying the credit and the uh, rest 40% is going to be used for the traditional consume, which by the way is not enough, so they have to use credit to, to live. In a way, it's a kind of a perfect scenario uh, for producing credits because most of these people have to use credit to have an everyday life. Of course, on weekends, it's so expensive to move to the center of the city that they 
rather not to move. So you don't, they don't go to museums, they don't go to cinema, they just stay stays at this area, uh, most of them. Uh, also, uh, these houses has another problem. Uh, by law, each development has to build schools because it's impossible to have schools uh, or buses or schools in other places. So they have to uh, build uh, schools. But if they have a development with uh, less than 7,500 houses, they don't have to build a high school. So most of the developers just made developments with a little bit less than 7,500 houses. Sometimes if they have more plots, they divide, it, they divide the plots and they uh, save the money of the, of the high school. So you have uh, numbers from the National University around 7 million uh, young guys, not just here, also in informal settlements, uh, from 15 to 25 years old with nothing to do, with no, no school, no job. Why don't they uh, get a job? Because most of the cases, the job they can get will pay them less than the cost of transportation or mobility. So this system is also um, like uh, making a huge mistake mistake in terms of um, credit production because the sons, the son of the people who live in these places are, uh, will not be able to have a credit to have one of these houses, fortunately. Um, in a way, um, uh, this is like one of the phases of this uh, inability of work, but also uh, we can find a lot of uh, new cases of prostitution, between the neighbors, and also uh, drug dealing, and also a lot of violence in the streets, gangs. Um, it's really a tough, a tough uh, place. Let me tell you that in the last eight years, I have been working very close to an informal settlement. The name is Chimalhuacan. You will see it later. And in eight years, uh, I never have any kind of problem with anybody just a dog who bite me. But uh, in this place, I, I was, uh, well, a guy fight against me. Uh, some other guy uh, fights with uh, one of my assistants. I was uh, uh, get by the police and going, went to the, no, because I was taking pictures. It's really tough place. It's a really tough place to be in these areas. Um, the kind of land we have here is also informal because as we don't have any uh, metropolitan plan, these are uh, municipal plans, but each uh, major of each municipality is able to transform the laws without asking to anybody anything. So sometimes these guys, the developers, get to uh, with these um, uh, majors and ask them to to reshape the, the urban plans to have these uh, uh, urban permissions. Uh, most of the cases uh, through corrupted um, procedures. No? And um, the conditions are so awful that uh, by now, 25% of the houses financed by the state are uh, already abandoned. The people rather to leave the house, leave the credit, leave their condition to get an, another credit in the future, and they just leave the house there. Also, the houses has a lot of problems in terms of uh, quality of construction. They used to have a structural problems, so you can find a lot of breakings uh, in, the, in the walls and the ceiling. And, um, and, well, at the end of the day, these guys also, uh, the, this policy of the government to produce all these kind of, of housing houses. This is these houses that you are seeing is just the house, just the houses that we produced in Mexico City uh, from 1995. So as you can, and all the country is the same. And in a way, I have been um, searching uh, 
at how can they really apply their city's uh, rights and it's almost impossible because they are so far because sometimes they have to sign contracts uh, when they buy the houses which are uh, completely uh, uh, I don't know how to say it, it's uh, impossible to, to make uh, valid your own rights. No, I think the point is completely uh, understood, so we we'll, can return to the original presentation. These are the places, when you get to this uh, place you see a house uh, that seems to a, a suburb house, but this is not just one or two houses, they, they, they are four houses. So you live in the middle of a house, and you can see this Volkswagen Beetle, and you can see the size of a house. They are really uh, little places to live. They, not just, they are not just uh, gated communities, but also uh, they have a lot of fences and all this infrastructure to, to take out from the danger of the of the public space no what can we do in this scenario what can we really do because um, there are a lot of projects all around mexico from all uh, uh, a lot of architects including myself uh, that are trying to make a renewal projects urban renewal projects in which you can see uh, how can you use uh, land in the center of the city and bring uh, housing with density and well everybody's talking about uh, how can we do that but what can we do with this with these things that is uh, already built and uh, well what we are doing, or what my studio is doing, is trying to make this uh, unveiled. I want to establish a gaze uh, in which everybody can see what we are doing. And also, I am very worried because the people who live in these places um, used to feel frustrated, but, but, and they used to feel angry, but they really don't know why, because they just bought a house. And why buying a house uh, makes me so frustrated and so mad and so angry. So I try to bring meaning to them, working with them, and also trying to open this uh, gaze to an uh, expanded community. So of course I have been uh, talking in different forums with the politicians and with the developers, and some of them really don't want to talk with me anymore. Um, but. What I am doing is uh, other kind of expressions, trying to uh, make evident the kind of developments we are doing uh, as, a, as a federal policy. This is, uh, some of these uh, pieces are shown in uh, different exhibitions or sometimes in a billboard as the last one we saw. This is the 20% of the, of the houses that we see in this picture are abandoned. Um, this is the same. This is like the, the, a piece with um, the floor plans of the houses. It, it seems like a digital diagram, but this is the place where, the, where a family can live. And these uh, pieces are taken uh, from the advertisement uh, drawings of the developers. So uh, as you can see, let me know how, how can you go from this place to this one, because this is a sofa, no? So it's crazy, it's really crazy. And, and the president, uh, well, let me tell you that this scheme of, of housing is the national price of housing for the last 10 years. And the president is so proud that every day, once, uh, every day, every, every time he can, he expressed that he is producing a lot, thousands, millions of houses, and he's trying to solve and an issue. We were uh, also looking at my studio, different typologies uh, that could be um, similar to these ones, and we uh, find some chicken factories and also some uh, concentration camps, as this one in Germany in the middle of the last century, or this one. And they, are, they have really similar typologies. Um, which are a little bit um, frustrated, frustrating for me. 
I will show you at the end of the presentation another video in which you are going to see like the hope I have for these places. And my hope is that these places can become um, informal. Uh, when you are in an informal settlement, everything is, ev everything is completely the opposite from this. Because in an informal settlement, everybody wants to be formal. In a formal settlement, the, the wishful thinking is that they can become informal. And it's, it's happening, but very slow, and you're going to see it at the end of the presentation. The other context we have, and probably the most uh, large context we have in Mexico, and probably in Latin America, is the informal settlements. There are thousands of uh, kilometers, square kilometers, uh, that are growing in these areas. Uh, as I told at the beginning, I think that uh, the cities are an expression of the societies in relation with the historic modes, modes of production. And when we see the informal production we have in Mexico, this is the metropolitan area, and this is Chimalhuacán, the place where I am working. 84% of the economy is an informal economy without any kind of taxes or without any kind of regulation. Most of the people who live in these places uh, can't have um, a credit. No, They represent themselves as poor uh, as poor societies instead of the uh, people of this uh, huge development uh, I showed. Uh, they feel they are a middle class. And these guys are represented as poor population, as poor guys. So this is the, the informal settlement in Mexico. As you can see, they are very well greeted. They also have very defined plots. And this is a place where I am working right now. And as, can, as you can see, the streets are all, already drawing into the land. And the plots are perfectly defined. So this is a very organized development. And what happened is that they are linked, the people who get to, to these places to live, they are linked to a um, social organization. This social organization is a kind of Robin Hood. On one hand, they can help you to get a piece of land. They can help you with your children. They pay for the school. They build the schools, and they hire the teachers of these areas. Uh, also, they have a, 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 a university to, to teach the uh, kids to be teachers. So they have a reproduction of ideologies. In this place, they also, if you have, if you get ill, they they are going to give you medicines and medical services. It's a kind of parallel state, no. But at the same time, they are going to steal land. They are going to uh, um, make you go to the demonstrations, to political demonstrations. They are going to ask you for money so you can live there. So they they have these two phases, no. Most of the people used to see these organizations as mafias, but also as, um, as an option. If they cannot get a credit in, in the bank, they go to these organizations and they can have a house after all. If you can see, the people who, who get to these places are, are really poor. The conditions are really tough. They don't have water. They don't have drainage. They don't have electricity. They don't have... Uh, streets, they don't have nothing, just the plot. This is a six, uh, 1960s uh, informal uh, development. This is Ciudad Neza. 1.3 million people living in here. And it's an amazing place. Right now, there is 25 em uh, employments for each 100 uh, people, each 100 inhabitants. As you can see, they are completely well greeted. And they have like uh, these places with, with all the services. And these were um, um, an informal settlement as uh, the one I, I show you, the traditional markets, informal markets also. And most of these places, most of the houses has locals, uh, commercial places, and stores. Most of the people who get uh, to these places want a place 
that they can rent or they can use uh, later. This was the first place where I was working in Chimalhuacán, eight years ago, Tlatel Xochitenco. It's next to the Lake of Mexico, which is already uh, without water. No, You can see a part with water here. It's a beautiful lake. And this is a dump. I used to work in this neighborhood, which is Tlatel Xochitenco and the dump. Uh, when I get here first, um, I find people with rabies. And the, the way they take land is always pre-negotiated with somebody. If the land is uh, private, private property, they used to go with the owner and they make a negotiation so they can have the land. Most of the times they tell the original owner, well, we're going to take this land. You have two options. The, fir the first one is that uh, you, give, you gave to us the, pl the plot. We're going to pay some of the money and we are going to help you to, um, to be expropriated by the state so the state can pay you. These social organizations are so strong that they have uh, deputies and, and majors uh, governing this, these places. Most of them used to have these advertisements. Well, uh, a school, this is a school with a master degree, and this is serious. I mean, this is the way, the, the, the third one, the second ones that gets into these informal uh, developments are the uh, Federal Company of Electricity. Because when they just get to the land and, and go and live there, uh, they start to stall electricity. So the federal company of electricity uh, regularized them very soon. So they have an address and they, from that point, they are going to live in that house and in that plot forever. And the third ones to get in are the huge corporates such as Coca-Cola or Corona or, wh or whatever, that they have this incredible system in which the uh, um, chauffeur of the bus is uh, associated with a corporate, uh, corporate uh, such as Corona or Coca-Cola, and he's looking for new uh, for new clients, uh, his commissioner, so each product he sells uh, he's going to get a little uh, of money. So, um, well, everything is like getting strong, these informal uh, settlements. Also, most of the people who are going to live in these places have to be part of a group uh, early. So they have to work for a, for a year uh, together to have a, a piece of land. So when they get to the, to the place they are going to live, they, are, they already know each other. They know uh, who is who and they know uh, uh, everything about the other guys. If you go to the leaders, you're going to see that most of them has uh, Fidel Castro behind them. And also, uh, this is no joke, they, this is, they have a lot of relations with Cuba. Uh, actually, the, the alphabetization for adults is in charge of the Cuban government and the Cuban government is paying for it. Well, I, I, I think that uh, we can create another approach from architecture. Uh, it's impossible to really do something here because we can make plans, we can make incredible possibilities in these places. Uh, I have been working with a lot of these possibilities. Uh, urban possibilities, urban strategies, but everything is like a kind of fantasy because n nothing happens. How can you deal with this context? So uh, what I'm trying to do is uh, trying to bring meaning to, to different groups through, um, um, through workshops with the people. So uh, I, I want to work understanding aesthetics as a way of um, uh, bring knowledge and, and create a kind of meaning from, uh, for it. And well, the first exercise I did was this one in, in Chimalhuacán, such as, such as in most parts of Mexico, but particularly such as uh, Ciudad Juárez. A lot of women used to be killed by 
some guys who are in, in a party and they get drunk and see a girl and they just kidnap her and killed and whatever, no? So uh, there are hundreds in Chimalhuacán. Uh, the, municipal, the municipality just recognized 11. So the, uh, uh, one day in uh, one of these communities, in one of these neighborhoods, and the people just were, were walking in a sidewalk, and when they get to a particular corner, they cross the street and go in the other sidewalk. So I asked why, and they told me that they found one of these girls in that particular plot. So we began this project with the people, and we, are, we were trying to bring meaning and also uh, uh, information to the people who, who live around there. So we generated these little plaques with information about uh, gender violence, and we left it in the places where the women were found. It was a kind of urban intervention, but with the people, so the people can create a kind of meaning of, uh, for the loss or, or, for, or for the girl that they found there. It's, it is where, uh, like when you go to a cemetery when somebody just died. Um, and we, uh, have, uh, we wanted to, to bring meaning to this. No? So we did this project. I think it was successful in, in the way that the people really get engaged with these kind of expressions and with these kind of exercises. I have been doing a lot of them. This is another one. Uh, I was one, once in the dump in a beautiful day, so suddenly the sky were open without smog, and we could see from Chimalhuacan, which is at the far east of Mexico City, to the corporate building, Torre Mayor and Santa Fe, which are like the opposite at the extreme west of the city. And I was amazed by the invisibility of these places. So I want to return visibility to Chimalhuacan and particularly to the dumps because they were living in the worst scenario possible. In these dumps, the people look for things with the hands, not with the eyes. And, um, and what I try to do is a um, very strange project, by the way, because in Mexico we have the Virgin of Guadalupe, which is like the holy image, uh, the, the most important holy image that we have. And each time a guy finds an image of a Virgen de Guadalupe or a kind of drawing similar to the Virgin of Guadalupe, they used to call to the media, to the TV media, and they go and they make a, 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 a TV program and they make a chapel and they make a, a, a transformation of, the, of, the, of that place. Also, uh, when the garbage service is not working, the people used to leave their garbage in uh, particular corners. So um, the people used to uh, make a little altar for the Virgin of Guadalupe. So the, uh, the neighbors stop living uh, garbage in that particular corner. So what I did was uh, getting 700 figurines of La Virgen de Guadalupe, and with the help of different students, I I, I throw it in 700 different uh, trash cans all around the municipality inside of garbage bags with uh, garbage, ex expecting to find at least 50 of these figurines in the garbage dump and, the, and trying to make the people call to the media and the media goes with the cameras and whatever and see this reality and make an urban transformation. A way happens, but uh, a little bit later. Three days later, we couldn't find a single figurine, but a week later, we began to find these new altars. This was one of our virgins uh, all around the mun municipality. The people began to uh, build uh, new places and transform the, their spaces because they found the figurine. So uh, we, were tr we were working with symbolic issues and I think that the only way I really can uh, get inside the community and, and really involved with their identity uh, was through uh, symbolic issues. So I started to work with that symbolic issues um, in Chimalhuacan. So I, I began to do a workshop with the people to doing housing. This is Chimalhuacan, 
This is Mexico City. This is Chimalhuacan municipality. As you can see, it's as, a, at the far east of Mexico City. As you can see, it's very well greeted. In 1995, the census uh, tell, tells us that it was uh, a municipality with 100,000 inhabitants. Today, there, there are 600,000 inhabitants, a middle, uh, half million in just 15 years. And it's completely well greeted. This is the social organization transforming land. So, and also uh, without the control of the state or the federal government. So what we did was to get with the people and start to asking what they want to do, what kind of houses they want. And they start to do this kind of drawing. So we, we start to, to talk about their drawings and talk about their, uh, uh, the kind of life they, they have and the kind of life they want. And uh, we make models of their uh, possibilities. And we start to show them that it was almost impossible to live in a, um, in a place like this. So we began to, start to show them different basic issues for, for architecture, such as the sun, such as the natural ventilation, such as the scale and the natural lighting and the heat control and the efficiency on the structures. And they began to understand all this knowledge. They began to understand what, uh, uh, how to design with us. Uh, we decided to talk about the different conditions each family and why we need different kind of houses for each one. And we began to design together uh, with the students, with the help of some students of the university and the people. We began to create a new kind of um, workshop in, in which the design was like the uh, consequence of just the dialogue. And also the design uh, wasn't looking for shapes or for architectural, uh, architectonic expressions, but uh, we were uh, looking for uh, quality in, in the place, quality in terms of sun, in terms of natural ventilation, in terms of the basic things of architecture. And we did it. We did 17 houses, 17 different houses. And when they start to, to build, they <coughs> couldn't follow the original plans. <laughs> no? Sometimes the, the Builders, because this is self-construction, but they hire a, 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 a construction worker who is going to help them. These construction workers, they, they really don't want to see our plans. They, they cannot read them. and They don't want to do them because we were doing everything with less material and he's in charge also to buy materials and whatever. No? So we start these houses. Um, it's a very slow process because the, the people just get a piece of, of land and they, are, they have to build in the next month because if they don't do that, the organization is going to take out the, the, the plot. So they start with uh, sometimes the foundation, sometimes a wall, sometimes a, a cardboard, a, a little house. Uh, so this is a, a very long process. We end this workshop in 2010 and right now, they, some of them are living there, some of them have the foundations. There are different conditions in the, in the plot, in each plot. No? But they are following the principles. They are following the principles of, of the natural lightning, of the natural ventilation, of the shadows, of the uh, control of heating, of the efficiency on the structures, no? the shadows, natural ventilation. They used to have a, a very a strange scheme in which they, um, the first thing they, uh, they traditional build is the, is the fence. And then they are, are going to build over the, that fence. So we stop doing that and, and begin to do a different kind of, of, of schemes. Uh, in a way, it's not a, an issue of forms. It's, a, it's an issue of quality of life. It's an issue of... Um, the origin of a house in which we can really create a meaning for us and for our families. And uh, I am very uh, happy because these people are really, uh, really felt or feel 
proud of the way they are building their houses. So they invite other guys and they tell them, hey, look at, uh, look at this, we are doing this because we can have light, natural light and natural ventilation. And they, are really, they really feel proud of it. So uh, that's what I am doing now. Uh, right now I am trying to expand these kind of workshops through Chimalhuacan, uh, help, uh, helped by, by the university and with other friends, uh, anthropologists and sociologists that are doing and are designing a, 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 a more uh, sophisticated uh, program for the workshops. Uh, one of the families in this place uh, get to me the day they have to take the land and told me I have only around $1,000. What can I do with that? What kind of house or structure can we do with that? No? Uh, so I really couldn't have an answer. She did a house of cardboard, uh, very, very bad. But we take the, the idea and we see that we should bring um, another possibility, another possibility, I'm sorry. To build with really, uh, with $1,000. So we create this project. Uh, um, in the first, uh, in the first uh, exercise we, we did, we actually built, we expended $2,500 to create a structure of 50 square meters. This is based on gabions. Gabions are these uh, wired uh, boxes uh, in which originally they uh, put in stones. Uh, I think Herzog and de Meron make this famous uh, building in Napa Valley with gabions. Uh, so we use these gabions, instead of uh, 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 stones, we use sandbags. And we start to create this, this structure, uh, which is really cheap. And it's also an um, exterior foundi foundation system, so we discovered that you can build one floor above it. If you have a stronger structure, uh, uh, beams, structural beams, no? So uh, this project was like a um, uh, first response uh, a little bit later because it was like two or three months after the, this woman asked us for doing this. And um, the people of the social organization see the project and they were like interested in, in trying to make a one works. And actually they built one. I will show you. Uh, we were starting the construction. As you can see, it's a very simple technology. It's like uh, stone over stone or brick over brick without anything else. Just um, uh, with a very simple uh, kind of, of hand labor uh, with very cheap materials. And we began to build a house. We have a, a budget from the social organization uh, associated with the state. They gave us um, more or less uh, $2,300. At the end of the day, I, I give another 200 no? But this is the last picture we have. We already have the, the, the ceiling, which is a laminated uh, ceiling, uh, roof. But the structure is work perfectly, and they are going to use this as an office uh, for the social organization. It's a very strong structure and really, really very cheap. So we can have options for making other kind of architecture. We can have options for this. And from these exercises, I am doing my, my work as architect in my studio. This is a house for a friend of mine. He's a painter, and he... Um, asked me to do his house, so I did this house without anything but the construction ma materials uh, with any uh, decoration in any place of the house. No, We have, uh, uh, because of the uh, plot and the plot circumstances in, uh, uh, next to the street, as you can see, it's a very 
uh, it's in an antique barrio in Mexico with a very thin street. So uh, if he wanted to, to keep his car, we wanted to make the house above. So we create this space. And we create a very simple house. It's a box with uh, basic services. But what is interesting for me is this. We spend 53 US dollars, 50,000 US dollars, instead of almost 57 of these houses that we are doing in the outskirts of the city, this uh, financial way of production. And for me, this is not an issue of shapes again. It's an issue of solving problems. And to, to, to really understand what is the problem, about the context, the social context, the economical context we have around us. Uh, from this project, I was invited to do this one. This was this is um, um, security facilities in in Guanajuato, and these security facilities right now are stopped because of the cri the crisis. So the, 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 they are not building anything for the moment. I hope they do, they do um, and. In this project, we have not only a police station, but also a pre-jail, a, a, a place where the, the people who get uh, by the police uh, is getting there. And from there, they, they have to spend there uh, about 48 hours, and then they can go free or they can uh, go to the jail. Um, and in this particular place, in this pre-jail, they used to have a lot of problems in terms of torture. So the police guys torture the people, no? So, I have to make a, a kind of surve social surveillance system and the structure, and I just did a structure that allows this social, uh, this, uh, social surveillance system. The, the plot is a, a really long plot, 300 meters. So I did these really long walls. Then the slabs, concrete slabs not, uh, for the floor and for, for the roof. And in the other uh, way, we have only crystals. Uh, uh, crystal facades or no windows. We also did um, ventilation system and a natural lightning system. This is like the other kind of section, and that's it. That's the project. Um, the red uh, points are the services and the restrooms and bathrooms. Well, you, you cannot see it very well. This is the pre-jail. This is the Offices, bureaucratic offices, this is the uh, police station, intelligence agency. And, um, and you can see that, you, uh, well, you can see from each office to the next one, from each space to the next one, uh, most of the times. So it was a kind of uh, project that was made with earth, wall, earth uh, compacted earth. Uh, ramp their uh, walls, concrete slabs, and windows. And this is uh, exactly the same kind of architecture that I was trying to do with the House of Saul, and also the same kind of architecture I was trying to do with the uh, with workshop. It is about understanding. It is about uh, stop representing uh, anything, just leave the spaces so the people can represent themselves in the spaces. And, uh, well, uh, these two little examples um, uh, shows that my work right now is oriented to that. I will show you the video that I already mentioned, uh, which is a, a video in which you can see my uh, my better wishes for the social housing developments, which is this, and I think I will end with this presentation. And this, this was also used in an exhibition so that people uh, really 
start to understand what are we doing in this um, kind of support that we are producing in Mexico. And this is more or less the way they are and the way they are reshaping the 